Thanks to everybody who's made the time to come along tonight. Uh, my name's Jess Daniels. I'm one of the biosecurity liaison officers with NTCA. Um, our other biosecurity liaison officer, Senny, is also online. Um, we will have our cameras turned off for most of this, just so that everyone's got plenty of screen to see. Um, I'll just quickly do some introductions um, around the room for your presenters. Um, so in the green shirt and the hat is Dr. Rob Williams, our Chief Veterinary Officer, for anybody who doesn't know him. Um, at the back in the blue shirt is Anthony Burridge. Uh, Anthony is the Senior Legislation Officer with Livestock Biosecurity. Um, in the cream shirt, we have Bill Dalton, Livestock Biosecurity Operations Manager. Um, and then at the front in the green shirt is Michelle Barker, who's the Senior Livestock Policy Officer. Uh, I'm about to pop into the chat a uh, link where you can anonymously submit questions if you want to. Um, alternatively, you can put your hand up um, and say them out loud, or you can just write them in the chat as well, and I'll read them out for everybody, uh, whatever you're most comfortable with. Uh, that's it for me. I will hand it over to the department. There's no sound coming out. Yeah. Sorry, can you can you hear us? Yep, I can hear that now. Oh good. Yeah, my apologies for that. Um we were accidentally muted. Um so um yep. Yeah. My name's Rob Williams, as um, Jesse's already introduced, uh, up in the Northern Territories, Chief Veterinary Officer, just over 12 months. Um, and uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight, um, taking precious time out of your evenings to uh, listen to um, some discussion around biosecurity management plans in particular, but overall our emergency animal disease preparedness. Um, I've just been asked to give a few opening words before we launch into the presentation. And I think uh, most of us would be familiar with the threats that sit off um, just off our shores um, in the in the near region, particularly foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. But I guess also some recent events have probably sharpened our minds as well, not necessarily related to cattle, but um, we have had a rabies outbreak that spread now into Timor-Leste, uh, which we're watching closely. And we also have seen the events that have changed just recently with um, the high pathogenicity avian influenza. Now, again, that doesn't affect cattle, though there is an interesting link that I'll talk about towards the end of the presentation. But I just wanted to sort of reaffirm that um, whilst the media might not be paying as much attention to foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease, certainly our attention in terms of our everyday existence is around protecting the territory, and partic particularly protecting the cattle industry against these threats and also then being prepared uh, should we unfortunately have to deal with uh, one of these threats on shore. So I won't um, take up too much of your time, but again, I'd really like to thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to have a question and answer session um, towards the end of the presentation, and I really encourage you to ask as many questions as possible and also to reach out after, our, uh, after the webinar uh, and make sure that you get your questions answered. We're here for to support the industry, to make sure the industry is well prepared or as prepared as it can be uh, for emergency animal diseases, but also to make sure that um, biosecurity uh, practices are part of our everyday existence. And we know that the industry already has biosecurity as top of mind, but um, I guess uh, some of the changes that we've made recently, particularly in the legislative side of things, um, indicates that we are treating this very seriously. So I'd like to hand over to Anthony Burridge, our legal officer, and um, he will start us off with the presentation. Hi, how you going? Anthony um, Burridge here. Um, just to give you a bit of an overview on some of the events we actually did do. Um, 
Uh, obviously, the key amendments, obviously, as you know, are the voluntary vice community plan framework, um, the new trespass laws uh, for all NT agricultural industry. Um, we've obviously changed some notice period to retrieve your stray livestock under Section 27, and that was um, the focus that was on um, biosecurity mitigation um, risks. Uh, more efficient and effective EAD response and control powers for the um, for the chief um, veterinary officer, and obviously a streamlined appointments for uh, appointing police uh, in peacetime and also during an emergency. Um, um, yeah, yeah, obviously the purpose of the legislation reforms is it's pretty much you know obviously as Rob has raised this to enhance the territory's biosecurity capabilities. Um, going forward, it, it will um, we really kind of do need a shared responsibility, come clean, go clean. Uh, a very big um, focus on the messaging going forward to be around those kind of um, concepts. Um, and obviously trying to incentivise mitigation of bicycle risks at the farm gate level um, as we move more towards risk-based regulation models. Um, obviously responding to evolving, and um, evolving complex and evolving disease threats improving our traceability capabilities if an EAD or an EAD outbreak and recognise potential of wide ranging economic impacts for industry and community if we, if we do get an EAD event. Um, actually, uh, the legislation's uh, amendments that were made were made to the Livestock Act in the regulations themselves. We actually did two lots of one hit. Um, it was more efficient to do that at the time to get with parliamentary um, um, time. Um, next one. Um, bias, well, obviously, you know the bicycle community plans. The 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 benefits be, are behind the bicycle community plan and legislating mean legislation wants to recognise the in, individual biosecurity uh, risks at the property level and in uh, economic impacts of diseases. Um, to us, that was very key for us, and um, it's it was recognising your that you've got a business to run on your land. And how can we actually help step in and to basically assist in this in this place? In, in actually recognising your biosecurity risks. Um, the key benefits of, of the biosecurity plan is obviously allow better controls over the entry and movement of people, vehicles and equipment. We found during our research when we were actually putting together the framework was that markets are wanting more and more assurance along every point of the supply chain from, from birth to end consumer. And we did notice where governments actually still start to step into this space that, um, that it did, they were taking notice. Um, and that's what we did find. Um, market, markets do take notice of, of how we inject ourselves into supporting and protecting industry. And obviously, um, it's all about it, it, it helping you to incentivise your bicycle risk at the farm gate level. And obviously, we we to actually help that space is obviously we legislated. Um, we put an, an appliance and enforcement regime in there with penalties um, to also assist in this space as well. Um, hand in hand with these new laws, the new bicycle mention plans is the amendments to the Trespass, um, the Trespass Act, and this is basically going to be a, the, the new laws apply to all agricultural and private production industries, and it's to actually capture more serious and trespassing offending, and it it's all aimed at addressing the more heightened bicycle economic and safety risks we now find ourselves in. And others again recognising the complex and evolving disease risks facing the territory. And obviously, police as inspectors so I've already mentioned, it's obviously streamlined the process for NT police officers to be appointed, whether it be individually or um, during peacetime. Um, the idea of um, having this new structure was that uh, in consultation with the police commissioner when we were drafting these these provisions was. They wanted to only have uh, police officers appointed um, individually that have uh, requisite um, background in stock and um, partial experience. And we were very supportive in that area. And also during, but naturally during uh, uh, an emergency event that all news, that all police officers could be quickly appointed under a Gazette um, framework. Um, obviously, we had to make some amendments to Section 27 um, to retrieve stray livestock. What was driving behind all this was um, we haven't changed um, the actual premise of Section 27. We just had to move it back a little bit um, to try and incentivise um, 
to incentivize people coming to some kind of agreement if they can. We found 95% of most people out there have very good relationships with their neighbours. But it's also it was also we had to keep looking at the through the lens and the focus of um, mitigating our biosecurity risks. If if cattle was regulatory straying over different boundary lines, there was a, a concern that how do we manage that kind of biosecurity risk without basically trying to bring incentives into uh, into this into this space to um, to help owners at the same time also mitigate our biosecurity risks. As you as you may already know. Um, it's now 40 uh, it's now we actually encourage you to come to an agreement with your, with your, with your neighbour if you can and then if you can't obviously then you can give a 14 day notice period um and then you obviously again nothing much else has changed in in the section 27 you can still muster as in, as per the notice um leave the property but also within seven days of entering the property our disease control powers this is what's the main focus uh, along with the biosecurity management plan um, legislation and also um, uh, our amendments to the trespass act was to basically ensure we have very flexible and efficient powers at our fingertips there was some um, gaps in there where we did recognize that um, around abandoned and owned, unowned or feral livestock um, those gaps needed to be actually uh, closed but also the most important thing is it's about flexibility, be able to actually focus in on the disease uh, and um, basically get people back to business as quick as possible. That's that's the driving um, focus behind the disease control powers amendments. And any, if anyone any questions, we're happy to take questions at this stage. I uh, apologise, we just rushed through this. We, we do notice it's, it's tea time for a lot of people. And um, obviously, we're just trying to keep it um, moving for you guys at the moment. But we're happy to take questions any time. Let's move on, team. So, uh, my name is Michelle Barker, um, as just introduced, and um, I'll be going through the biosecurity management plans. I'll <clears throat> Not as loud as the guys here, so I'll try and speak up a little bit to make sure everyone can hear. Uh, so uh, if you've got questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask. Um, I can't see the hand raising. Um, Jess will be able to see that. But if you wanted to voice a question, that's also OK. Or you can hold your questions until the end. Um, com we're completely flexible with that. There is a lot of material um, in this segment. and not knowing um, all of the participants that are um, on the webinar tonight or that might look at it in the future. Um, there's a lot of information here. Some of it will be too much detail. You, some people will be further advanced. They've already got biosecurity management plans. Uh, some people will be just at the beginning of the process. So um, please, you know, bear with us and, and take from it what you need to. Uh, so, as you would already know, the Northern Territory Cattlemen's Association um, have been providing support to the cattle industry um, in, in, via their team, Romy, Jesse and Senny. So we're very grateful for their assistance and, um, yeah, they've done a fantastic job um, looking after uh, the cattle industry and already communicating uh, and doing a lot of work on biosecurity management planning. Um, also, there's the North Australian Coordination Network uh, that's also in conjunction with NTCA and they will be continuing to um, help with general biosecurity um, education and awareness. So, uh, yeah, please reach out to these organisations as well as our livestock biosecurity officers uh, in the regions and in Darwin who are also across all of this biosecurity management plan. Uh, so there is a new web page that's been out since the uh, legislation was came into force in April. And so on that particular web page, which we can just flick over to, make a mess of this, um, there is the steps here of everything that you need to know, well, maybe not everything you need to know, but a lot of information about biosecurity management plans is on this page. So. Um, we won't go through that page tonight, but um, we will, sorry, apologies. Um, we will go through a lot of elements 
of that page. So the components that are involved in the biosecurity management planning process and to ensure that your biosecurity management plan and system is as compliant as possible with the legislation. There are four elements. Uh, people that keep livestock would already have a property identification code at PIC. Uh, without the PIC, that, that's really central to um, being able to enforce your biosecurity management plan, especially if there are issues with persons that come onto your property without consent or if they um, are a trespass, if it's a trespass issue. So uh, these elements, all of these four elements, assist in making your system compliant. So they're all important. So we're not going to go through a pick, how to get a pick, that's pretty easy. Um, but we'll go through um, the management plan, the signage and access management. So the biosecurity management plan, there are many steps involved in this. Um, as I said, some people will be further along. Some people might already have an existing BMP, but those that don't, there are industry templates available. We'll have a quick look at those. Um, you can update an existing BMP. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, people of pastoralists will be looking at what specific uh, situation their property has, what risks they have, the nature of their business. Um, We'll go through developing some reasonable biosecurity measures. Uh, the zones, farms can be zoned according to risk, uh, some example maps, and then how to finalise the plan, which needs a cover sheet, which we'll talk about, and then how to notify that the plan is in place. So uh, the plan templates and options. So there are some people that might have already developed a custom plan, which is absolutely fine. Um, no problem with that, but there are templates out there on the Farm Biosecurity website, which we'll have a look at. And those um, properties that are accredited with LPA will already have uh, the LPA requirement number six, uh, which has a biosecurity management plan um, involved in that. So uh, with the Farm Biosecurity and uh, these are just some quick screenshots. They might be a bit small to see, so we'll just have a quick look at, their, at that particular web page. Uh, so I've got that just here. So if you have never done a biosecurity management plan, this is a good place to start. There's a lot of resources available here. So you can um, just tick whatever um, livestock that you might have. You might just have beef and chickens. If you save the farm profile, uh, you can come down a bit further and magically there is a very small arrow here, which is, I didn't know it was there, you wouldn't see it, but it gives you a template there that you can use. So not everybody will want to go this way, but it does have some good ideas. And if, you, if you're looking at something a bit more comprehensive than these, um, it's at least a starting point. Um, and there are also some other really good um, uh, resources there, and we'll actually come back and have a look at the action plan a bit further along in the presentation. Um, so if we just open that plan template, I'll we'll go through the beginning, but it goes through the various inputs um, and considerations. So it's, it's still helpful. It's not very... Um, editable, this document, uh, so it's sort of got yes, no, not applicable, So, but it's a starting point. So as I said, everyone will have, uh, will be at a different stage. Uh, so there's another resource on that website called a risk assessment template, and it's really just looking at, again, going through, do you think that any of the things on the list are a risk to you and it just helps you identify areas that you might want to focus on. Um, but looking at the livestock, livestock movements, what farm supplies you have coming onto the property, you know, you, you might also be sending hay out of the property, what are your production practices, um, waste management and water, keeping water clean, uh, what invasive species you have in your area that may present a risk to uh, your livestock, 
and how to manage people, vehicles and equipment. So there is another document that I mentioned before, the action planner, and I'll just give you a quick look at that. So this document, this is just a, a screenshot of part of the document, but it actually goes through your potential risks the potential actions you can take to the risk and then there's other columns across to the right that allows you to make some notes about whether or not you think this is important. Clearly every property is going to have completely different circumstances, different, different livestock, different breeds, different parasites, um, different weather conditions, different practices. So it's a very unique um, situation for each property uh, and there's really no shortcuts to um, doing this, of course. Uh, but that's a really helpful document. So um, then it goes through farm outputs. Are you moving plants or animals off the property? Um, if you're going to, well, we don't really have sales in the territory, or well, not very many, but, um, yeah, just movement of livestock, and that could be as simple as camp drafts and things like that too, uh, rodeos. Uh, there are all sorts of... Um, different considerations. So that's that document was the Fund by Security Action Planner. And um, I've got that here. So it's a long document, it's 22 pages, but it's it's really comprehensive and it's um it's a really good resource. So I do encourage you to have a look at that and um yeah work through that if that's appropriate to your property. Now when you're developing biosecurity measures in the legislation, it's very important that biosecurity measures are reasonable because if you impose unreasonable biosecurity measures and then you want to later on perhaps um, prosecute somebody for breaching a biosecurity measure, if the measure was found to be unreasonable in the first place, then it will fall over. Uh, so they have to be reasonable and appropriate to the risks and the livestock and your particular situation. Um, so also just to note, beg your pardon, just go back to this slide, um, it would be a good idea um, to consider excluding commercial incompetence information because when a visitor wants to seek consent to come onto your property. If you if you give them that consent, you will need to provide them with a copy of your biosecurity management plan. So you would not want to have commercial and confidence information there. You may have an internal document that's a biosecurity or manual that you use on your property. Uh, not not all properties are going to have this written down, but just um, keep that in mind. Um, so. Because visitors need to know what their obligations are under the biosecurity management plan. Do, do you want them to wash down their vehicle? Do you want them to wear particular footwear or wash their footwear, et cetera? Uh, so these are just some very basic examples of biosecurity measures. As we said earlier, come clean, go clean for vehicles and equipment, people signing in and out on arrival and departure. A lot of properties have got this in place already anyway. Um, limit the number of access points to your property so you, can, you know where people are coming in. Use signs to direct the visitors to designated parking. Um, as we said, foot baths, hand washing and specific footwear, um, keeping feet in clean, dry storage area and inspecting it regularly. Uh, and, of course, recent overseas travellers, depending on where they've been travelling, um, we're always mindful of what risks come with that. Um, so there's a very, not very good resolution picture on the right of the screen. And this little box down here is orange. I hope you can see my cursor just down in the bottom right hand corner there. So this property has looked at um, the various areas on their property and they've rated it according to risk. And that's part of the process. And they would have different um, biosecurity measures for different parts of their property. And a property doesn't have to have a, BM, uh, a biosecurity management area on the whole property. It could be just part of the property. So that's would again be unique to each property. Uh, so 
these are just a couple of example maps because a map is required in the BMP. We'll get to that in the next slide. But the slide on the right has got a biosecurity management area over the whole property. Um, and so they've got entrances and signage at each area, whereas this property on the left has only got a biosecurity management on area on part of the property. So it's completely dependent. Each property will be different. Uh, so to finalise your biosecurity management plan, and even if you've got an existing plan, you need to add the BMP cover sheet. So this is a cover sheet that we've developed to ensure that the critical uh, prescribed information is included in the plan. Uh, so there's a, a short list on the right here, which includes some of the um, prescribed information, but not all of it. So I'll just go to the, the cover sheet is available on our website. It's probably gonna be underneath that bit that I can't get to. Okay, we'll go another way. Uh, we'll just open it again. So this cover sheet, it's really important. So biosecurity management plan must be in capitals at the top. That's why we've done this sheet. The property address must be at the top. So it's a, a document that can be edited. Um, and then all of the mandatory fields have got an asterisk in them and they all have to be completed. So we've gone through the legislation and the regulations to ensure that we've captured um, critical information. Uh, so when you develop your biosecurity management plan, if you can attach this document to the front of it, that would be fantastic and it will, will help a lot. The document also needs to include a map of the property. So it could be a map like that or it could be another map that you've got. Um, you then need to notify the livestock biosecurity team that the plan is in place. Um, and we've sent emails out to pick holders already to advise them of what that process is. Uh, and you also need to notify details of the nominated contact person because visitors need to know, A, that a plan is in place so that they can request consent to access the property and they need the name of the nominated contact person in order to know who they should contact. So um, if you want to check if there's a property in place, oh, sorry, a BMP in place on a property, you can go to this pick list. There's a link to this on our BNP site. Um, and to find out if there are if there's a BNP in place, you can just type yes into the search bar and it will come up with all of the properties that have got a BNP in place. So that this column on the far right says whether or not it's got a BNP in place. So if it's got a BNP in place, People can then go up to this link here, active, active BNP contacts, go to there, locate the property they want to go to, and then they can get the phone number and or email address of who they need to contact to seek access to the property. Uh, whoops, sorry. So now we'll get on to the signage. The signage is, is is very uh, prescriptive. It's this or practically nothing. This is what is required under the legislation. I think the only thing that could be changed is the word stop at the top can be changed to the word visitors. But other than that, everything has to stay exactly as this is. Other than this QR code, which I have added, um, there is a template for this signage on our web page. The size of that particular sign I think is, is 600 by 800, which is larger than the minimum size. I'll, to, I'll go through the minimum size shortly. Um, and we do have uh, free signage for properties that have a BMP in place, and that is being distributed through NTCA. So if um, yeah, once you uh, notify us that your BMP is in place, we can just work through getting signage out to people. 
I think at the moment it's um, about four or five signs per property, uh, which is a, a really good start. The QR code that you see here, so we have already generated a unique QR code for every single pick holder in the NT. This is very important to um, buy, our biosecurity team because in the event of an EAD outbreak, this unique QR code is used to support effective tracing, which is absolutely crucial if there's an outbreak. Uh, so the data, if, if, the, if this QR code is used and it's used through our biosecurity app, the data I think is retained for 90 days, Correct. is it, Anthony? Yep. Cool. Thanks, Bill. Um, for 90 days uh, and then it drops off the system. Uh, NTG does not access that data at all except if there is an EAD outbreak. And why um, 90 days? Sorry? The reason why it's 90 days is... Um, the gestation period for lumpy skin is about, what, 57? Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's 28 days for lumpy skin. We go back 56 days, two incubation periods. But there are other diseases that we've incorporated for. 90 days was seen as the most practical sort of compromise between collecting too much information stored there on the system and also making sure that we got good coverage with tracing. Yeah. Uh <laughs> Yeah, so people come to the front gate. So the, the sign is there to let people know a plan is in place. It's not necessarily there for people to seek consent to access, although if they haven't got access, they certainly know when they get here that they should be getting consent to access. So usually people are going out to properties, going out there for a reason, um, and they'll probably ha will would have already contacted um, property owners or managers before they get there. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's serving a purpose to let people know don't go in without consent. Um, there will be there is facility down the bottom here for people to put their details there, so people can then contact them. And there's also a QR code, so there's a check in. So the, getting the consent is not the same as checking in. They are definitely two different things, and I'm sure everyone knows that already anyway. Um, so the signage, as we discussed it, it has pre prescribed information. Um, if you make up your own sign and it doesn't have all of this information on here, it may not be compliant with the legislation, which may, as we discussed earlier, um, jeopardise whether or not you're able to um, prosecute people who breach uh, the biosecurity measures. Uh, prescribed, there's a prescribed minimum size, prescribed location, the unique QR code we've already spoken about, and um, the sign template we've already spoken about. So if you have a BMP in place, you must erect signage. It's, it's a requirement of the legislation. It must be at least 450 by 600 mil. And it must be conspicuously displayed at each public motor vehicle and pedestrian access point. Some people out long way out might think people are not going to walk there, but there are places that are closer and, and some people have camping and all kinds of things. So um, it's still important. So each major, sorry, each public motor vehicle and pedestrian access point where the where the plan applies. So it's really important. Um, so managing access is is a complicated area um, and we will go through this um, so please uh, write down any questions that you've got and we'll, we'll go through them as they come up or, or at the end either way um, so people are going to come to properties and they may be um, people that that could be a tradie that's coming, it could be a truck driver that's coming, it could be deliveries that are coming, um, could be family, it could be all sorts of people. So there are uh, some groups of people that will not need consent, for example, if they live there. There are some people that will need consent, for example, a tradie. And there are some people that will have a statutory right of entry like power and water who need to come and read a metre. 
um, and they they don't need consent. They need what's called a notification of entry. So we'll go through that in a bit more detail. Um, again, we've got QR codes involved, and we'll talk a little bit about visitor management systems and um, the NTG biosecurity app. So if there is no registered biosecurity management plan, they don't need um, don't necessarily need consent, although they may still in some cases. But if there is a plan in place, then visitors must comply with biosecurity measures. Um, so we just got some groups of people here, depending on the reason for them coming to your property. Uh, so if people are living on the land, could be family, could be workers, there might be a community living area on a, on a pastoral lease. Um, well, we've got groups of tradies, uh, service contractors in the second group. Then we've got, like we said, power and water and bushfires um, who have a statutory right of entry. Um, and then we've got foster king and commercial exploration. So we'll go through that in just a little bit more detail. Um, so this first group of people where they reside on the land, um, they're, they're actually already on the land. They're already part of the, the property's biosecurity management plan anyway. So consent in this case is not applicable. They don't need consent. Um, and of course, pastoralists that do have community living areas would need to engage and um, talk to uh, people who are living there about how it's all going to work. Um, the main group that will need consent is um, people that are coming there for a specific reason. So they don't live there, they don't regularly um, visit there. It might be different if you had a governess that was coming every day but they lived off site, um, they probably might fall into the first group rather than the second group. Um, but they do require consent. Uh, so then there are the statutory officers who, so if a statutory officer is coming, uh, like Parent Water, they will need to give notice that they are going to come. Now, the legislation says that they need to give notification of entry as soon as is practicable. So that may not be before they come. So in the case of bushfires, so my acronym down here, BFNT is Bushfires NT, they're going to fight the fire first and they might give a notification of entry next week when they're back in the office. Um, so that's, that is a tricky one. Um, but, you know, their, their, their priority is life and property and that's what they'll address first. Um, Power and Water, they, they've been very um, um, cooperative and they've, they've been talking to us about how they will adapt their policies to um, accommodate the fact that there are biosecurity management plans on particular properties, uh, which has been fantastic, um, and biosecurity officers as well, depending on the situation. If there's an EAD, they, they may not be um, providing a notification of entry, but Similarly, in an EAD, that they're going to be in, in good communication. There'll be plenty of communication about what's going on. Um, commercial exploration, they do have, um, in many cases, um, a statutory right of entry, um, but they will need to give notification of entry uh, and, and they need to abide by the biosecurity management plan as well. So there's a lot of words on that slide. It is very busy. Um, and we're going to look at it again also about who needs to comply and who has to comply and who should comply. Um, so apologies for the busyness. Um, so those visitors that need access and they need consent, uh, they need to contact the nominated person to request consent. So as a property owner or manager, you can provide consent um, it must be in writing or electronically, so email, text message or some other visitor management system. 
the person that's been given consent must keep a copy of the consent on them at all times when on the property in the biosecurity management area. That's a, a requirement under the Act. Sorry. Um, and they they must have a copy of the BMP provided to them. So again, that's where you don't want to make sure that there's not commercial and confidence information there. Um, so they need to, yeah, be able to look at it, know what their obligations are so that they can comply and they must abide by the biosecurity measures. Um, statutory officers, their notification of entry, uh, as I said before, they can provide notification as soon as is practicable. Um, they still should have a copy of the BMP because that helps them comply with the biosecurity measures. If they don't have a, con a copy of it, they can't comply. Um, so the, the QR code, we've talked about this already, and but we do recognise that there are other visitor management systems that are already out there, that are already in place. Um, so the QR code that we produce may not be used by every property. So for us, that creates a, 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 a big gap in information because we'll have... Um, be able to access visitor data from some properties, but the properties that don't have that QR code, we won't be able to access directly that information. Although in an EAD outbreak, we would make every effort to contact every property to see if we can have access to that information um, in whatever format is, is slow, appropriate. It slows it down. It does slow it down. Um, so it's not as effect, effective or efficient um, or fast as if we had the NPG QR code. However, we do recognise that there are already visitor management systems out there that are already being used <coughs> and they come with lots of other bells and whistles too. So it's it's completely up to the property. Um, there is a biosecurity app that is being developed by NTG. It's not quite ready. It's in trial phase, I believe, until the 30th of June. So it's being tested at the moment on um, some pro pilot properties and hopefully um, early July that will then be available. Um, all of the features that are listed here are not going to be available right up front. I think um, the check-in, report a disease, uh, book inspection and contact us, I think, will be up front and I think get a permit and make a payment might come in the second tranche. Uh, so that will be great to have that going when it's when it's with us. Um, and there will be a um, a web page that, that um, underpins that, so it will be web-based as well. Uh, and actually, can I just, sorry, I just want to pop back to this screen here, uh, just saying that the people who reside on the land um, should be complying with the BMP. Um, <coughs> the service contractors that come on must comply with the BMP. Um, the statutory of officers, the wording in the legislation is that they should require comply, but clearly bushfires often can't. And the mineral exploration, the commercial exploration, they must comply with the BNP. Sorry, I didn't quite finish that when I was there. Um, so there are lots of resources available. Uh, the bi Farm Biosecurity website has multiple resources. Integrity Systems, that's um, livestock, livestock Production Assurance, have lots. National Biosecurity Training Hub has lots of resources. And, of course, our website does as well. So that's it for me, and I'll just um, hand over to Rob um, for a little bit more. Yeah, so that's nearly the end of our presentation, but just to take us back to the start, I thought we'd just um, give you just the current situation at the moment with um, highly pathogenic avian influenza, and I guess the key question is, well, that doesn't affect us, so who cares? Um, but this current H5N1, which is circulating globally, it's not in Australia. The current HPAI outbreaks we have in Australia are actually different 
types. They're all H7 types, so but don't get too worried about that. So let's just talk about the global situation at the moment, which has caused a lot of concern. Um, this virus has now been found to affect at least 50 different species of birds and crossed into mammals. And believe it or not, it has actually crossed into dairy cattle. It's not causing significant disease, but um, unfortunately it is affecting milk production. Um, and that has been uh, a documented, well-documented effect in the USA where they've had um, H5N1 uh, for quite a long time. So I guess the thing, probably a key message from us for preparedness, uh, the, the key question is why? Why would you worry about that or why, you know, why are you preparing so much? Well, the reality is we just know biological systems can be very unpredictable. So the threats that we think are there, obviously a foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease, and we're preparing certainly for those, but don't forget there are threats that we haven't seen yet or threats that we've seen but act in a different way. So um, our messaging is not to be overly concerned, particularly with um, the H5N1 situation, but to realise that we are preparing for all eventualities. And part of our shared responsibility under biosecurity is to make sure that we're, uh, one, <laughs> we are um, making sure that we are well prepared for um, for any situation. So, and um, I won't go into all the details around the transmission of, of highly pathogenic avian influenza in dairy cattle, uh, but just be aware this has been a very unusual development. So we are, and we're certainly focusing some of our resources at the moment on HPAI, not so much because we we don't have a commercial poultry industry in, in the Northern Territory, but we're certainly focused on it from a wild bird surveillance point of view. But also there are these unusual events that we don't predict, but we need to prepare as well as we can for them. So that's probably a good good way to end. Um, and we'd certainly like to spend the last uh, five or 10 minutes um, um, hearing any questions and having any discussion that um, would be useful for you. So I open the floor now to questions. Um, I've got a couple that have come through that I can kick off with. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, the first one is, who do I report to if someone comes onto my property without consent or notification? Yeah, so firstly, um, making sure that you do have your biosecurity management plan in place and registered with us. So that's the critical thing. But yeah, the, the first person you should re report to um, it is the local livestock officer, so the livestock biosecurity officer. Uh, so the stocky in your region, whether you're in Darwin, you know, Catherine or what have you, hopefully most of you know your stockies. If uh, for some reason you don't know your local uh, livestock inspector, then please feel free to come through our generic number. And I, I, do we have any contact details um, on, no, not for a phone number, but we do have a generic um, number that we you, that comes through Darwin and we can assist you there. So contact us. That's that's probably the key message. Uh, and we'll we'll look at things like um, what evidence you've been able to collect. Um, and probably worth saying in this first twelve months we are going easy because it's this is a new a very new way of operating. So what we're trying to do is do a, a lot of education awareness at the moment. Uh, with our um, biosecurity messaging out into the general public. So particularly those groups that we don't usually reach, like um, tourists, uh, recreational fishers and recreational hunters, those people who come onto your land often without consent, um, they are the people we're going to try to target with um, their biosecurity obligations now under biosecurity management plans. But yeah, d definitely contact us or your local livestock inspector as, as your first point of contact. If it's um, a threat to life or property, uh, then please yes. call triple zero. Yeah, so that becomes a police matter. If, if it's an egregious or it's an aggravated sort of situation where you have, for example, animal activists coming onto your property, uh, then we that must go straight to the police. Uh, we, we can't assist with uh, with an aggravated or a, an egregious sort of um, matter, we can certainly help in terms of um, you know understanding the biosecurity risks. Uh, but the, it becomes very much a, clearly a police matter if um, if that's the case. 
the biggest thing is um you know everyone's got eyes and ears it's the collection of evidence and everyone's got one of those in their pocket nowadays and there was a phone for those who didn't quite see that so yeah and with a camera on it and if it's you know obviously if it's um, life-threatening or they they they've got you know they're, they're people we're after the rat bags not the um mum and dad tourists who've just left the beaten track for a bit you know you, um we all know sort of who they are um and it's just the more evidence that you can collect it will assist our investigations yeah so and just to sort of um, maybe we didn't cover it in any detail the, the reason why the legislation is important is it does uh, allow us to issue infringement notices i won't talk about them in any detail because anthony is our legal expert on those but um the bar the I'll say the threshold for evidence is much lower for an infringement notice versus obviously uh, as you enter into more criminal matters. Did you want to make a comment on that? No, that's about it. Um, obviously, the main focus is on consent and, and people giving you prior notification to come on the property if you've got a, a BMP in place. Um, as Rob did say, um, that the next, that it's, going to take, it's going to probably take about 12 months to settle in. It's been, that's been the actual journey for most jurisdictions where they put the BMP framework in in place but please if if the person who you think is trespassing on your property where you got a bmp in place got a gun um definitely i'd be ringing the police um yeah that's definitely uh obviously pretty high risk there yeah so thank you for the question thanks um and the second one is uh, has there been engagement with groups that have a statu uh, statutory right of entry onto pastoral property, I'm assuming that is? Uh, yes, and in fact, it's been quite extensive engagement over the last 18, uh, probably actually nearly two years now. So we, st we started the journey uh, potentially two years ago, I think it was, was yeah. it right? Um, and we have, um, we've basically been, uh, um, on a carousel of, of, of consulting with all the key stakeholder groups. That includes um, key stakeholders across other government departments, but also um, as many as possible, what I would call uh, private industry groups, or definitely obviously NTCA, but um, even some of the other industry groups that we wouldn't ordinarily talk to, such as recreational fishers, uh, pig hunters uh, group, we've talk, uh, spoken to, well, we spoke to other government agencies like bushfires and Department of Environment and uh, all the land councils. We've um, we've had extensive um, uh, discussions with with uh, particularly the uh, NLC and CLC. Um, and we know um, just as you've just for being candid, we do know that um, not everybody was happy with these livestock uh, act amendments. We understand that. Um, and we're very sensitive to that, but also um, it didn't stop us from getting the outcomes that we wanted from uh, protecting the territories, particularly the territories cattle industry, but also protecting your rights as a pastoralist, um, protecting your uh, property from not just the, the biosecurity threats, but also as we talked about the aggravated or the potential aggravated threats that come from um, you know animal activists or others that are entering onto your property for nefarious means. That's why we linked it to the Trespass Act. That was a pretty important linkage. Probably not so much for us on a day-to-day -day basis, but it was a very important linkage from a legislative point of view and for the police. So to, to engage the police in this matter, um, the police actually were quite supportive of us starting with the biosecurity management plan as your sort of, your that was your foundation, that's your starting point, but then you build on that. There's a number of layers that sit above uh, the biosecurity management plan and one of those layers is obviously if you do get to the unfortunate circumstance of uh, of uh, someone who is flagrantly and and willfully um uh entering your property without consent and and as uh just uh, piggyback on that uh is obviously this is going to take a bit of time to settle down and obviously education awareness is pretty, probably going to be pretty uh, much the focus for the next 12 months this is a big shift for the Territory in, in many ways and obviously we've been now privy to what the journey has been for other jurisdictions in this space 
and it, it did take at least 12 to 18 months for it to settle down in other jurisdictions as well. And But the most important thing is that we will get there, I think, in the end. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thanks. That's questions? all the questions that have come through to me. Excellent. I've just got a couple of other things. That, so yep. a lot of you would know Adele Kluth, who manages um, picks and brands, and um, she, she just wanted me to highlight for everyone, um, when you notify uh, Livestock Biosecurity that your plan is in place, we, don't, we do not need a copy of it. We don't keep copies of it. Um, so, yes, please notify us, but don't send a copy. Um, Again, if you need assistance with your bias, developing your biosecurity management plan, please feel free to contact our livestock biosecurity officers in Darwin and, and all of the regions. Um, and also uh, with the PIC register, uh, there are a lot of properties that have not updated their property details for some time, and we really, really need them to do that. So if you're listening tonight or you're listening to this webinar in a week or two weeks or a month or a year, Please update your property details regularly and as soon as possible if you haven't done it for some time. But, um, yeah, that's it from me. And thank you very much for your coming tonight. Yeah, and thank you to Jesse and Senny and, and NTCA in general. We really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I do just have someone typing in the chat, so we might just wait a minute. and Yeah, make sure oh, definitely. Yeah, questions. thank you. It was just a big thank you, you guys. Um, an excellent presentation and very valuable. Um, yeah, if nobody else thank you. has any questions, I think we will leave it there. Um, this webinar will be available on the NTCA website hopefully early next week. Um, and there will be a follow-up email come out tomorrow just with um, the links that we've gone through tonight, uh, some contact details for people who can assist. If you have any further questions or need help with biosecurity planning, um, and you're more than welcome to contact NTCA um, if you have any further questions. Thank you very much. Excellent, and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.